best damn show we can do for those three people you because it. it matters to them. You got it. Meanwhile, I'll sell the Indian rug. <laughs> but okay. Where, where did where did the insult act start? Because obviously you're doing it somewhere before you got on Carson. And well, Indian. you know, you say start. My whole my whole life, even since I was a kid, I was always uh, the guy. As most actors, and I think you will agree, I'm basically shy, and so I was a very inhibited guy and very shy. And my mother, Esther, was a very uh, strong lady and aggressive. My father was outgoing. And so to, to cover up my insecurities, I started ribbing people because I didn't know how to communicate. And, I, you know, my uncle would come in the living room and say, close your robe, you look ridiculous, you know. And I, <laughs> you know. And I would make fun of my family, and uh, it sort of became part of me because that was my personality. And yet when I'm away from the camera and I'm and I'm with my family or friends, I still kid around a great deal like that. But uh, basically, it started just being part of me, and then I embellished on it, and it became a show, so to speak. Way back when, you were working those old burlesque houses, right? With acts like, uh, we have researchers here, acts like Monique Levine and Zokina and her King Cobra. <laughs> I remember the Cobra. <laughs> but I, 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 I didn't call them burlesque houses. I worked what they call, we call them strip joints. I mean, they were like uh, the exotic dancers. Those girls worked very hard. And they had a, about 10 girls, continuous entertainment, about five comedians. And we went round and round and round from about, I used to go on, say, 11 o'clock at night until about 5 in the morning. Continuous, you know, and just with sailors. And that time was the war days. It was right after the war and sailors and soldiers and they were all just looking for the girls so that kind of comedy was tough there was no improv you know with bud freeman who was great for young comedians but it was it was tough you know guys used to just sit there with zip guns and want to pick you off you know waiting for the girls so that i'm guessing is really what put it in high gear this kind of insult the audience sort of thing because they're they say hey get off we want to see the the girl with yeah, the ball constrictor yeah, right and, and i and i could never tell a joke to this day i couldn't you know if you were you and i had a party i mean well, you and I wouldn't be at a party. But I mean, <laughs> if, we, if we were at a party, I, I, I got a little ridiculous. I started to think we we're going to hang out together, <laughs> which is out of the question. Absolutely, it but is. I'm a very busy man. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Running after Joe Garaggio going, Joe, do they like me? <laughs> but uh, I, I, I did jokes. I was saying about jokes. I, I did jokes badly. And, and I did impressions, you know, like a million other comedians. And they were going right in the dumper. So I started to talk to the audience. And over a lot of years of talking to the audience, when a guy would yell at me, I'd say, I'm getting fed up with you. You know, I'm going to suck your neck or whatever I said in those days. And they'd start to laugh. And so it became a conversation with the audience. And that's how that insult thing became little by little without writing one thing on a piece of paper. It just became part of a performance. And over many years, it developed into what I, what I consider a, a full job. But it took a long time. I don't know if I got the chronology right here, but sometime in the mid-50s, you were at a Hollywood club called Slate Brothers. Yeah. And is that where you met Sinatra or first got close to Sinatra? Actually, I met him in a place called Zardy's Jazzland. He came in with Peggy Lee many, many years ago in California, which no longer exists. And he brought in a party. In those days, he wore the straw hat and the coat over the shoulder, you know. He brought in an entourage. And, and it's the old story. If Frank laughs, everybody with him goes, you know. I said, good evening. And Frank went, funny, funny stuff. And all the guys went, it's a funny joke. <laughs> they all talk like that. The so guys. it's kind of an honest reaction that you can really gauge your material by. <laughs> what he thinks is funny, I fall on the floor for. <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, he, he was great because he would bring in a lot of celebrities and, and people that enjoyed. And, and they, they really, uh, he was a, a booster that way. But how did you get the courage at that stage of your career? You're not Don Rickles with Tonight Show appearances and everything else. How did you get the courage to early in your relationship, say from the stage to Sinatra, Frank, make yourself feel at home. Punch somebody. <laughs> I mean, you know, Jilly Rizzo could have come up with an Uzi, and that would have been the end of it. <laughs> I don't know Jilly Rizzo. <laughs> <laughs> don't drop names like that, Bob. Don't you have a family? <laughs> uh, last time I checked, someone call St. Louis. <laughs> see if they're still breathing. <laughs> I can see you on your show tomorrow night, just sitting in the chair going, why, why does the left side seem numb? <laughs> but I, I, I got to tell you that... Uh, the, these these uh, people that uh, so-called, uh, like Jilly Rizzo, dear friend, guys, he would bring in all uh, the guys, what I call street people. That, and I'm, I'm, I relate great with street people. And that was fun for me, you know, to, to bring in guys that I could really hit with the jokes and how I say to Frank what I said. You have more courage as you're a younger man than you do today. I mean, I still do what I do. But in those days, you, you, you threw... 
you threw it to the wind. You know, anybody that came in and said, Frank, I'm really getting fed up. I don't care who you know. I'm going to make you limp when the show's over. You know, whatever I would say to him. And he would laugh because you just, you just knew by looking at him that he was for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and it's been like that ever since. Dean Martin uh, was a key uh, player in your career too yeah. because I guess shortly after you'd been on The Tonight Show Martin had his own uh, his own show that was on on Thursday nights yeah. uh, at that time in the 60s and, yeah. and he used you a lot right yeah Dean Dean used me the, the big break with Dean was once with Roy Rogers which was a, a fun show and, and yeah, if you know Roy he was a, a guy you know that uh, you know he would laugh at grass growing <laughs> so uh, but it was a sweet man and uh, we had a lot of stuff to bounce off with him, but the big thing was uh, uh, they turned around and uh, had had me uh, go with all stars in the audience. Uh, they brought uh, oh, about 15, 25 stars, and they said, Don, just let the cameras roll and you make it up and pick on all these people. <laughs> Ernie Borgnine's laughing. Big Academy Award winner. Remember you and Marty? He was so brilliant in Marty, and today it's over. <laughs> that go figure this business baby rosemary so many years i've known you remember the old days you mary small are all in there <laughs> and now your career is slowly sinking into the <laughs> look at this bob newhart just said to the wife he's not going to mention me <laughs> bob newhart went into shock his name wouldn't be mentioned one of the great stammering idiots of our day bob newhart when did you first go on Carson? I started at the very beginning with him in New York, and everybody was afraid to put me on. Uh, they said, oh, this guy, this guy. And Carson was, uh, and Freddie DeCovita, 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 uh, a good friend. They, they said, hey, let's, uh, Peter LaSalle, they said, let's give Rickles a shot. And uh, they did, and the chemistry worked. I mean. <laughs> it's like a motorcycle going by the <laughs> I thought we were in Iran. <laughs> But, uh, gee, I didn't know, but you got a great studio, real soundproof. <laughs> Guys in the hall going, <laughs> and, and the whole place hears it. But uh, chip in and close the doors. But, uh, <laughs> you're a dull guy. <laughs> How do, you, how, do you, how do you stay on it? Even at 1.30, it's dull. <laughs> but uh, I must say, uh, uh, these kind of these kind of things work for me, and and so I I just threw it all to the wind. What about the time? And there were so many appearances on the Carson Show, and in the sixties and seventies, when you would come on the Carson Show, it was one of these deals, uh, like it later became with George Carlin or Steve Martin. Mm. You, you'd look in the TV guide, or you'd hear the night before that that person was going to be on, and you make a special effort to stay up and watch it because it had the feeling uh, of an event. What ones stick out in your mind? Well, the interesting thing is. He would, we always make notes, you know, like you do. Any, any host always makes notes, and he would always say, they would tell him, that Don's going to discuss this, we're going to discuss that, we're going to talk about uh, Newhart, and then we're going to talk about uh, this, this trip, that trip, and blah, blah, blah. And we, he never looked at the card, and we never did. And I'd come by, and in Johnny's way, he would just look at me with that, with that stare and just say, well, you know, and I would go from there. You have signed a $3 million deal to appear here once no, a no, week. No, no, what do you, no. And, uh... <laughs> With a clause in, if you're moody, maybe. Because <laughs> Ed told me that. He said, what a deal he's got. Huh? <laughs> I got to sit on the couch like a moron, and I was a colonel. <laughs> Attitude is very important. Milton Berle once told me that uh, many, many years ago. And, and so right, which I think uh, young comedians, some of them that don't make it, to have an attitude. Mine was always, you know, the angry guy, you know, come on, coming on Bob Costas, like I saw you in the hall and said, I don't need this, I don't want it. I mean, and no dressing room, you know, it, standing in the hall asking the cop to stand in front of me while I take off my <laughs> pants is ridiculous. But I mean, so it's all attitude. That's, that's what makes the performance, I think. Attitude and, and, uh, and how you say it. There's other guys that can say certain things to people saying, you're an idiot. And but it doesn't come off funny. If you have a way of saying it to a person, they'll laugh. Roll the film. But well, do you want to explain what it's about? No, who cares? You don't care. <laughs> well, no, it's about it's yeah. a, us against the world. It's about a group of uh, wonderful stars from the different networks, all the big names: mm. Susan Katz, Al Lipschitz, <laughs> Barry Green, Marvin Farnham, yes. Lou Brat. <laughs> Oh, uh, Nicky. Getting on my nerves, Lou. <laughs> you used to say at the end of your shows, I'm not sure if you do it anymore, but at the end of your nightclub act, you used to say, uh, you know, it's all an act and uh, I hope I haven't offended anybody. And some people who were fans of yours said, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't get out of character.